Tewaka, ki te moenge, tewaka, ki te takato rungai, takato ai, tewaka. Willkommen. Stocking my cap, I lay in the grass that shimmered in the breeze. The blue sky preened itself, and fields of sunlight rolled along the valleys. I go back until evening swept over forest and mountain. I knew they would find me sometime. My speechless ancestors played like mice among my dreams. It grew cold and colder. I woke to the river running over my bed of stone. I've come to know that where a river sings, a river always sang. I listen. This much I have learned. In the democracy of identity, you have just heard three welcome from our panelists, Witte Maida, Philip Temple and Cathy Cordansford. And from me also a very warm welcome. Herzlich willkommen zu unserem Podiumsdiskussion Traditionen und Landschaft, wie sie sich durch zeitgenössische Weltristik in Aotearoa, Neuseeland zeigen. Dies war ein traditionelles Willkommen, eingeleitet durch, die, durch das Tritonhorn, mit einem entsprechenden zeremoniellen Gruß von Witte Ihimada und einem wunderbaren Gedicht mit der Zuhörerqualität Listening to the River uh, von Philip Temple. We are here together because it was the vision of the director of the Frankfurt Book Fair, Jürgen Boos, to invite Aotearoa, New Zealand, as guest of honor in 2012. It is said, where there is no vision, the people perish. Or positively rendered, where there is vision, the people thrive. Director Jürgen Boos saw that in Aotearoa, New Zealand, something unique was happening, a bicultural, bilingual nation has emerged from the brink of a civil war in the 1970s and this biculturalism is increasingly open to and incorporating all the multicultural facets come about through immigration. Jürgen Bros, Tanja Heke, project director, Sarah Ropata, manager of the books and literature program and their teams, Namihi Nui, thank you for bringing this vision into life. On the panel here today, I have the honor and privilege to be with three visionary writers who in literature and life have done exactly that, bringing vision into life. Philip Temple, Kathy Koa Dunsford, Witi Ihimaira, they share a special gift, a taonga. They are empowering others through their writing and all their work. Each, in their own way, have moved their traditions to new vistas. 
In the order of speaking with the first reading, first Philip Temple, he lends his voice to those who cannot speak for themselves, epitomized by his works on the environment. Secondly, Cassico Dunsford, who edited the first five New Zealand and Pacific women's literary anthology, giving Maori, Pacific, and Pakia women a voice in print. As third speaker, Witi Ihimaira has edited numerous anthology, including the renowned Te Ao Marama series, giving Maori writers the opportunity to be published. In fact, he refused to be published for a while until publishing houses took on other Maori writers. A very effective means, as it turned out. Thank you, Witi. Namihinoi. All of this is manakitanga in action. Manakitanga can be understood as furthering, augmenting the respect for dignity and authority of the other. Now to Philip Temple, the writer. Philip Temple's first book was published 50 years ago. It was the first of more than 40 titles across a wide range of novels, non-fiction works and children's books that have won them him numerous awards and honors. Philip's themes have been similarly wide ranging, but one theme has constantly concerned him from his earliest work to his latest, the New Zealand landscape, the place and identity of people within it, and the even more special place of its wild inhabitants. Two of Philip's novels, Beak of the Moon and Dark of the Moon, are noted as unique in New Zealand literature. In these, he entered the world of the famous mountain parrot, the Kea, and flies with them in celebration of the Southern Alps mountain world. He also shares the stresses and disasters that have been visited upon birds' natural environment by human development and encroachment. The novels and subsequent children's picture books arose out of Philip's work in aid of protecting this endangered bird. His latest picture book looks at environmental and climate change in the Southern Alps through the life story of one Kea. Now to Cathy Coa Dunsford, she has forged a new genre by bringing storytelling onto the page and transferring her social and political activism into riveting eco-novels. Of these, Kaiti Akitanga Pacifica her eighth eco-novel is the epitome of what she stands for. In the words of Alexis Wright, author of Carpentaria, which won numerous award awards, Kaitiakitanga Pacifica is a dazzling virtuoso from a master storyteller, one of the finest writings in the world today. With the fullest attention to the complex world created in the novel, Cathy Coa Dunsford rewards the reader with the generosity and magnificence of her spirit and the strength of her cultural interconnections over a vast area of the world, which she holds together in all of the novel's delicate threads with a strong depth of knowledge in the laws of ancestral wisdom and a finite sense of their relevance to the contemporary world of the Pacific. And as Liz Millward, professor of the University of Manitoba, Winnipeg says, while the previous novels have attended to struggles against colonial powers and corporate greed, this one turns beautifully towards wayfinding and a shared future based in a practice of guardianship. She is an award-winning novelist and poet of 25 books in publication and translation. Witi Ihimaira may be known to many of you. 
one of his best loved books, The Whale Rider, was released as a feature film and has received worldwide acclaim. Witty Imaira has been a celestial navigator and wayfinder for Maori literature. Without you, Witty, many of Maori writers would not be in print today. You have been like an icebreaker through a colonial literary scene. And since then, Maori literature has flourished in unprecedented ways. Witi Imaira was the first Maori writer to publish both a book of short stories and a novel. After a career as a diplomat, Witi Imaira took up a position at the University of Auckland, where he became professor and distinguished creative fellow in Maori literature until 2010. His books include Tangi, Ponamu Ponamu, The Matriarch, and Nights in the Gardens of Spain. He has also written libretto for opera. The numerous awards he has won include the premier Maori Arts Award, Te Tokoti, Te Tokotike Tike a Te Wakatoi, in 2009, and the New Zealand equivalent of a knighthood in 2004. The Parihaka Woman is set during the 80s and 1870s and 1880s at Parihaka, a peaceful Taranaki settlement now synonymous with passive resistance. It tells the story of Erinora, who must find the strength and courage to protect those she loves. Philip Temple will now start our panel with his reading. Aotearoa, New Zealand, <clears throat> is the youngest country on earth, so far from the rest of the world that it's less a part of it than, than its model. Its islands form an exemplar of the world's landscapes, and on a planet increasingly burned, ravaged and poisoned, it's a South Pacific life raft for ancient forests and pristine waters with skies that remain cerulean blue. For New Zealand was the last habitable corner of the world for human contact far enough away from continents to be last found, last settled, last damaged. Before humans arrived, a rare natural ecology had developed, a land without mammals and dominated by birds, including the biggest flightless bird that ever lived, the moa. But then that scourge of the natural world, human beings, arrived and brought dramatic changes to this natural paradise. The first migrants were, of course, Maori, seven or eight centuries ago, followed by European, mainly British, migrants about two centuries ago. The impact of both waves of migrants on an innocent landscape was similar. During the 500 years following Maori settlement, about a quarter of New Zealand's forests were destroyed by deliberate or accidental fires, often in pursuit of the giant moa, which became extinct, along with many other species of birds. But as Maori became more settled, more part of this new land, they began to treasure it saw that the need to take care of it in a growing spiritual relationship with the great forests and rich seashores. When British settlers arrived in the 19th century, the pattern was repeated, <clears throat> but, the, but the destruction of the landscape was much greater as they brought the technologies of the Industrial Revolution. Much more forest was destroyed, more bird species disappeared, especially under the impact of introduced mammal predators. About a century passed, before Pākehā New Zealanders began to be part of this new land, to treasure it and saw the need to take care of it in a growing spiritual relationship with its forests and mountains and seashores. Everyone in New Zealand is the descendant of migrants, and the poem I read at the beginning, Ancestors, was by South Island Poet Laureate Brian Turner, who speaks as a descendant listening to his ancestors through the voice, the song of the river. More and more New Zealanders have begun to echo what Turner has to say in another poem. That you love nature is easy to say, until you learn that unless you act accordingly, 
it will call you to account in the end. Both these poems are from a new collection called Elemental, and the fact that it was recently at the top of the New Zealand bestseller list suggests that more, th more and more New Zealanders are taking this message to heart. The generations now that the great New Zealand poet Alan Curnow referred to when he wrote in 1943, not I, some child in a marvellous year, will learn the trick of standing upright here. My own writing about landscape began with the epiphany of first encountering the magic of the Southern Alps on a snowy spring night. I wrote, I became a child of the mountains and nothing seemed more virtuous or valuable than to explore and understand the face of a high landscape. For some years, I struggled with how to write a novel about the mountain world that was both authentic and imbued with the character and spirit of the landscape. At last I realised that the answer had been flying around me as I scaled the mountain peaks. The kea, the mountain parrot, the most intelligent bird on the planet, and which dominated the Southern Alps natural world. So I sat down and wrote Beak of the Moon, which is a view of New Zealand's natural world from the inside out, of what happened from the Kia's point of view when human beings came to destroy their home. Based on exhaustive ecological research, the book contains no human metaphor and it contains nothing that Kia's cannot do. It's a celebration of New Zealand's natural world and has become a cornerstone of Southern Alps mythology. I'll finish by reading a short extract from the beginning of Beak of the Moon as the main character, Strongbeak, looks out at his home of Kawi. Not far above the Kia kind scrub lay scree slides and rock cliffs, shattered and still snow streaked. Much higher still, the snow mantle lay thick upon the rain wind mountains, so that on the great ridges and jutting peaks there was little rock to be seen, and the ice fields at the end of Kawi were still hidden. Despite falcons, of which there were a few in Kawi, and gulls which came and went, this was the Kia's perch. All these mountains, all this snow, to reflect the scarlet underwing, all these rough fields of Inaka, Hakeke, the flowers of daisy and buttercup, the berries of Patotra, Topuku and Takapo, all the high forest of beech and cedar and Taitai. Strongbeak jumped and flapped to another boulder, scrambled to its crest and shrieked in sheer satisfaction. And next year, um, German readers will be able to read Beak of the Moon in translation. Thanks very much. Thank you, Philip. That was gorgeous. Cathy Kua Dunsford follows and addresses the relationship between traditions and landscape through her reading. Ere Harpati is explaining the significance of kaitiakitanga, guardianship of the natural heritage, natural resources and people. The conch shell sounds and the kaitiakitanga Pacific hui begins at Te Kotiku Marae, Hokianga, followed by a porphyry of welcome. Ere Harpati greets the manahere guests and outlines the kaupapa for the days ahead. She talks about a whakatauki. We have a whakatauki or proverb which aptly describes our interdependence and the vital importance of us working together with each other and the planet for a sustainable future. Begins hutia tarito o te harakeke uh, and ends he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. If you pluck out tarito, the heart of the harakeke or flax, how will the bellbird sing? I ask of you, what is the most important thing in the world? You answer me, hey tangata, hey tangata, hey tangata. It is people, people, people. For me, this is an important whakatauki to remember, and I hope it is a symbol for the Kaitiakitanga workshop. On a very literal level, when you harvest harakeke or flax, you always have harvest from the outside in. The outside of the grandparents, then the parents, then the child. If you cut out the 
child or the heart of the flax, you cut out the future. On a wider level, this whakatoki is symbolic of the world today and how we treat each other on planet Earth. If we do not respect Terito, the heart of our existence, we'll have no center shoot or child symbolizing our future. If we hurt a plant or pollute our land or our rivers or oceans or hurt each other, we destroy the balance and can rip away the shoots that provide sustenance for future generations. I forgot to bring my glasses up and that's why it was a bit strange at first. Um, can't see those. Okay, the high mark at the end. Uh, the navigational eco-waka have landed in Aotearoa, New Zealand and greeted by Māori. Kauri is glad to be back on the land. She bends down to kiss the cream sands of the North Hokianga dunes. Etched into, etched in her mind is the vibrant painting by Herb Kawinui Kane of a waka being greeted on the black sands of Punalu'u Beach. At the far end of the beach, Kane Eli Eli rises up out of the sea spray like a vision. It's exactly as it was in her dream. She can hear the laughter smell the salt air, taste the poi being pounded on the sands. Coconut is split open. She rolls its sweet milk on the tip of her tongue, lets it drift down her throat. An old man stands in the middle of the beach, waving a fan of fresh leaves and welcome as a, he guides a waka safely through the breakers. Kauri imagines the waka leaving Hawaii for other shores just as they have sailed on this eco-waka journey. She sees Kana Eli Eli rising out of the sea spray like a vision. The waka leaves from the shore, bound for a distant land in the South Seas, a land no one has yet dared imagine, a land of incomparable beauty, islands that are connected to these beneath the water, islands that draw their spirit from the same family of gods. Land of the awakening dawn, land of the long white cloud, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Kaitiakitanga in action. They have laid the wero for the future survival as Kaitiaki Pacifica. No te roru, naku te roru, ka ora te manahiri. With your food basket and my food basket, we all have enough. from the Deutsch version of Manawatua Heart Warriors, and that's where uh, many Māori and uh, Pākehā people from and others from the South Pacific went to protest French nuclear testing on Mararoa Atoll in the Tahitian Islands. And Pitta is on the waka um, at the point after the nuclear explosion. <coughs> blows the conch in defiance of nuclear testing. An orca whale launches herself over the bow of the waka, echoing a haunting cry. <laughs> the paddlers raise their paddles to the heavens like spears. The whale launches herself back over the prow of the waka. <laughs> Pitus smiles. It is a sign. Their haka has been heard. Nā mihi nui, feelin' dark. Frankfurt, 
friends, ladies and gentlemen, we come from that part of the world which is still living in the world's good lung. We breathe wonderful air, we have wonderful mountains, and of course we are the uh, inhabitants who are the, the final uh, settlers um, of the world. Our um, original ancestor, the original ancestor of all humankind, of course, was a mitochondrial mother who lived in Tanzania. From her, there were a number of uh, migrations into various countries. And among the last of those migrations was that of a people who went to Taiwan, and from Taiwan down to uh, Rayatea uh, in uh, the French Polynesian uh, area. And then, of course, Māori are the youngest of the world's migrants. Isn't that great? Isn't that just a, a wonderful honour? So in Māori, then we always say that the, that the youngest ones, the pōtiki, are the ones who misbehave, the ones who are ruthless, the ones who are able to turn back and tell their elders uh, just uh, how uh, the world should be conducted. And so that's what we hope will happen here in Frankfurt. This uh, panel is called Aotearoa, Land of the Long White Cloud. And actually it was a woman, Hine Aaparangi, one of the very first Māori canoe voyagers who gave New Zealand its Māori name. On seeing the huge mist enshrouded cliffs, she exclaimed, He ao, he ao, a cloud, a cloud. And it appeared to be floating. So where to start? Well, perhaps by emphasizing that New Zealand is still that primal landscape that Hine Aaparangi saw, and that it exists in many dimensions. As a storyteller, particularly a Māori storyteller, it is my job, my job, to write this mythic landscape into existence, just that it is the task of Pākehā storytellers to add the settler dimension. And in my case, I therefore begin with a land fished up from the sea by a god, Maui, water streaming from the remarkable palisaded peaks. As the land rose from the sea, Maui's canoe was borne up on the top of one such mountain. It's the mountain of Herawini. It's the mountain of my mother, Hikurangi, on the east coast. Hikurangi has a status that you might not know about. It is the first place on the Earth's surface to greet the sun every day. I like to think that if ever any of us was lost in the dark universe, all we would need to do to find our way home is to watch for the first twinkle of sunlight at the other end of the galaxy to know where to go. Ah, kohikurangi tēnā, tērā. So New Zealand's landscape functions in a larger and more profound way than you might expect and in a more profound way that many New Zealanders understand. It exists in both time and space. When you look at New Zealand or Aotearoa, you don't only see it now, but also as it exists holistically in the past and the future. And to Māori, it is a living landscape, the natural world and humankind in an intimate relationship. This is why Māori are such fierce protectors or kaitiaki, as Kath Kaur has earlier put it, to the land and why we have fought for it for many, many, many years. My own tribe, Te Whanau Akai, was at the forefront. We say, Te Whanau Akai, hei panapana maro. Te Whanau Akai are a people who never retreat. And that goes for every Māori tribe in Aotearoa. And so I grew up in a valley with a sacred mountain at one end and a fortress at another and a river running between where my people greeted the new day with prayers of thanksgiving. They would go tēnā koe ranginui kei runga, tēnā koe papatua nuku kei raro, tēnā korua. And all I have ever done as a Māori writer is actually what Catherine Mansfield, a Pākehā writer, wanted to do about New Zealand, and that was to make our country, Aotearoa, leap into the eyes of the old world with all of its primal and psychic force intact, 
a land discovered by a people known as Vikings of the Sunrise, a landscape that we know is like no other in the world. It must appear as if floating. It must take the breath. Our mother is the earth. Our father is the sky. They are Ranginui and Papatuanuku, the first parents who clasped each other so tightly there was no day. Their children were born into darkness. We lived amid Papa's long hair until the time of separation, the dawning of a day on the bright strand between, held up, held up by many mountains. And so we live and breathe and stand every day to say thank you to the Sky Father above and Earth Mother below. It was their sacrifice, but they would want us to grow in this wonderful, wonderful world of light. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā taratara ki tai, he tio, he hoka, he hauhonga, ti hei Māori ora. is open for a kōrero for a conversation about uh, what we've just actually heard so beautifully, uh, movingly expressed by you three uh, writers and I still would like the first question to maybe you wrap up what, what you've just said um, in other words that is in your experience what is landscape for you what are your traditions? Can you make transparent for us the connection to landscape and tradition in your books and in your life? Philip, would you like to start off, please? <coughs> thank you. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> thank you both for sharing those wonderful things. Um, is this working? Yeah. Um, I, don't, I, was, I wasn't born in New Zealand. I came to New Zealand as a teenager. I chose to go there. And um, for me, it was a miracle discovering the mountains and the natural landscape. And through discovering the mountain landscape and writing about it, I became a New Zealander. But, uh, a lot of my colleagues um, who were born, uh, Pākehā colleagues who were born in New Zealand, like Brian Turner and the painter Graham Sidney, to them, they belong to the landscape. They are the, in fact, both of them rather look like the landscape that they live in in yeah. central Otago. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think that what has developed, especially over the last maybe 50, uh, 100 years, has been this developing sense of place amongst Pākehā. And I think it's probably stronger in the south uh, than um, in, in, in the North Island. Um, and there's a grand tradition now of uh, South Island writers uh, and their expressions of landscape. The North Island writers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my tribe is Te Rarawa, and my uh, hapu or sub-tribe is Waaraki from North Hokianga. And uh, Karen and I have actually just returned from teaching, working with Kaumatu and Kuia and Rangatahi up there on the Kaitiaki Tanga course. And by Kaitiaki Tanga, uh, I think Witi beautifully described it, but really 
it's about interaction with the environment. You know, uh, back in the old days, you saw these beautiful, beautiful, sublime paintings of the environment. Actually, some of the most beautiful paintings were by German artists back in the 17th, 18th century. But uh, what... Uh, what Kaitiakitang is about is engaging with the environment in such a way that you know there's very, very keen observation and you know exactly, uh, for instance, uh, Tumoana Marae, which is out miti miti out North Hokianga, when the, uh, when the uh, Tumoana Marae, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, and uh, in fact, when the spinifex or the tumbleweed, the tia tia, uh, roll along the beach, that is exactly the same of the year that the mussel produced their spat. So as they roll along the beach, they are also rolling the mussel spat, and so you get mussels right up the beach. So Māori know these, these tiny little facts that you think might not be important were facts of survival. You couldn't survive without knowing this in a land where, you know, you didn't have supermarkets, you didn't have any production of food other than the berries or the natural uh, bush food uh, or rongawa in terms of the healing. Uh, so really the kaitiakitanga is the, uh, to me, the natural combination of tradition and landscape, but it's an interaction with it that is not just uh, for the beauty of looking at something in a far distance, but for actual survival. Kia ora. Kia ora. Well, you know, you can see the care on his, um, on his uh, T-shirt. There's a line from The Tempest which goes, what is it? Exit running pursued by a bear. Well, I feel like I'm exit running pursued by a care <laughs> from the South Island. Um, well, John Mulgan, a New Zealand writer, in, in, in looking at New Zealand's landscape, he said there's nothing soft about New Zealand, and there isn't. There's nothing soft about New Zealand. The country is very hard and sinewy and will outlast many of those who try to alter it. That's what the function of Māori is, to make sure that our country is not altered out of all recognition to the kaupapa which Māori people have, which is to look after the, the, the country, the landscape, the mythic landscapes that we come from, the sea that we come from, because it is not just a something beautiful to look at, but it is also a resource. It's our food basket, it, it is our economic well-being, it's also our identity um, as a people. So sometimes uh, in New Zealand, while a lot of New Zealanders really love the idea of Middle Earth and of Lord of the Rings turning New Zealand into Middle Earth, again the Māori function as far as landscape is concerned is to protect it and to show other New Zealanders that in fact there is another landscape of fantasy, another landscape of passion, another story to be told out of the out of Māoridom. and you will have seen that last night if you were here uh, in the in the um, in the opening ceremony here on of this pavilion. But we are much more than that. We are, as Kath Kaur says, kaitiaki. Our function is to ensure that New Zealand does not lose sight of its original and primal identity as Aotearoa, he ao he ao, a cloud, a cloud floating. Uh, can I just respond to that? Um, over the last 40 years or so, th there's been these massive conservation movements. Uh, I think probably the uh, trigger for that was the saving of Lake Manapuri when it was going to be drowned for power. And this was uh, very, very largely a Pākehā movement. Uh, there are strong conservation movements. There's a new one starting in Dunedin now. Uh, it's calling on the government to assess, uh, have a risk assessment uh, uh, on the landscape and the, the way we are. And, um, th for example, if someone wants to drive a tunnel through uh, uh, the mountains in two, through two national parks, there's a very strong uh, group in, in, in Otago which is uh, fighting this. I've been involved with uh, th these kind of things uh, most of my life, in including protecting this very special bird. And also, through before I could write my books, I had to watch the bird and understand what it ate and how it flew and everything. And um, so th these are 
Di uh, the same but different. Yeah. Yeah, different but yeah. the same. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we have different approaches. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that contribution because it organically leads actually to the next question, which is amazing because it was in Europe we have the concept of Heimat for a place that is very special to us in heart and soul. Do you have such a place in Aotearoa, New Zealand, in your literature? Now, you almost, I would say, answered it, but I would like uh, the other two panelists to also uh, respond to what you've just said by way of uh, maybe the Fenua, the land itself, is the formative um, uh, power uh, which informs Tangata Fenua. And what you're describing seems to be a Tangata Fenua, a people of the land who are actually taking on the image of the land um, by their physiognomy. Uh, the question is, what is Heimat for you? Maybe, Kath, you... Yeah? Um, well, the, one of our, uh, our writers, um, Kerry Hume, um, she wrote this poem, Where Are Your Bones? My bones lie in the sea. Where are your bones? On southern islands soared by discovering winds. Where are your bones? Lying heavy on my heart. Where are your bones? Dancing as songs and old words in my head, deep in the timelessness of mind. Of course, for Māori, Heimat is Aotearoa. We have no other place to call our home. We don't. That's it. There is no other place that we can call ours. So for us, it is really very, very important for us to have this idea of Heimat, to make sure that that home is always there forever and ever, but not just for us, it's for our grandchildren, our grandchildren's children, their children's children. It's also because we have an implicit contract with our ancestors who stretch in front of us um, and we are accountable to them. So Heimat, is something that exists in time and space and exists and it exists as an absolute commitment there is nothing else we can do except maintain that commitment Kia ora. I would uh, agree entirely I agree actually with Philip's words and with Witty's um, and for me uh, I have many actually split identities because not only am I Te were Māori I have Hawaiian uh, on my father's side, and as we've now found Afro-American on his side as well, plus Croatian and who knows what other mix. So, you know, uh, certainly when I landed at the shores at Kalai and met my cousin Hanoa, I felt a familiarity. But of course, that's where Māori came from, Polynesia, throughout the Pacific. And, you know, what amazed me was the language. Um, kūpuna in Hawaii, tūpuna for ancestors in Aotearoa. Very, very similar words, similar gods, goddesses. Uh, I love this concept of Heimat because for me, it implies something more than just a place you are born or love. It's something from the heart and soul. It's, uh, it, for many of us, it's going to be a place you're born in. Uh, I've spoken to people that, some people I've, who just don't feel any Heimat and I don't understand what that would feel like. I think you would feel very displaced in the world not to feel some high mark somewhere. And I do know, I have contemporaries that's kind of just float all around the world because they're still actually looking for something within themselves. You know, I mean, the people who are, are looking for high mark in New Zealand are not Māori, are they? They're not. They are um, yeah. uh, people who have come to New Zealand uh, from um, overseas and James K. Baxter he wrote a poem which says these unshaped islands on the Sawyer's bench wait for the chisel of the mind but these islands have never been unshaped as far as Māori are concerned we have always had a shape so I'm really interested to know how Philip uh, you have managed to find a shape <coughs> from that uh, chisel chiseler's bench and created out of it your high mart well um I think I have a split home out. <laughs> um, my spiritual place is actually York Minster, that I come from Yorkshire, but I don't belong there anymore. I, I found my home out in New Zealand. But I'd like to say that, that many Pākehā in New Zealand, they are uh, up to sixth, seventh generation. This is their home out. 
And while going back maybe 100, 150 years, um, their ancestors came from somewhere else, they have no other place either. And I th what I said in my little talk was that they're taking more and more care of it as they go, go along. And I think Whitty's writing must come a little bit from his little bit of Irish ancestry. <laughs> <laughs> Kia ora koutou. Uh, thank you so much. That was, um, we have many more questions. You can ask anybody questions when we have rounded up this series. You've been a fantastic listening audience. Thank you for your patience and your listening skills. Oh. Kia ora. Yeah, we're done.